And we're in a series where we're talking about how God defines love. And, and sometimes it's very different from the way that world, the world conditions us to think about love. As you're turning there, uh, just want to pass on a little bit of uh, church business, a family business that David Mobley's mother, uh, Wilma, uh, passed away this week. Her funeral was yesterday, and so our sympathies and prayers are with him and his family. And then Barbara Lake uh, passed away this, uh, this past week, and her funeral was on Thursday. And so our thoughts and prayers are with that family as well. well as I said, uh, last week we began a sermon series that we're going to be looking at again next week as we look at this series of messages around love and what God says that love is and what he says that it is. It isn't. And last Sunday we talked about how godly love is patient, it's kind, it's selfless, and it's humble. And if you missed that one, you can go back on, go to our website and click on the uh, sermons and go back and find that one there and, and you'll be all caught up. But um, I also want to reiterate a point that I made last week when, when I said that love is, is more than a feeling. I got home and my son, he said, well, you used that one love song. You should have gone with more than a feeling and explained that one too during that point. But, uh, so I threw it in there for him just then. But it is more than a feeling. It's a decision that we make. And we're talking about being intentional. If we just let uh, people say, follow your heart, just do whatever feels right when it comes to love. That's horrible advice because our, our heart is selfish, the Bible says. Our heart is filled with all kinds of intentions and motives. That We need to pray for God to change our heart, and he's telling you what the pure love that comes from him looks like. So as we go through this list, I encourage you again, use it as a checklist to kind of examine yourself and say, how am I doing in this aspect of love? How do I do here, and what changes do I need to make? So today we're going to look at three more qualities of godly love and you can look at these in the context of romantic love if you want but you can also look at these in the context of family relationships and that type of love between parents and children or between siblings or or and you can also think of it in terms of your friendships um, and, and how we love one another so the next quality we, we come to today is that in first Corinthians verse chapter 13 verse 4 it says love is not arrogant you know, there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance. Um, I think we can all agree that it's good to have a healthy level of confidence. We try to instill confidence in our children to believe that they can, can do things. And without confidence, we a lot of times shy away from things that maybe God wants us to do. So it's good to have confidence. But I think we've probably all encountered some folks that have crossed that line between good, healthy confidence over into arrogance right and and they uh they have an inflated image of themselves and it becomes just quite frankly annoying that they think so highly of themselves i once heard a, a fella say he said you know i'd like to buy that fella for what he's worth and sell him for what he thinks he's worth i'd make a fortune uh, i thought that was a pretty good way of of putting that but we probably all have met those folks and we don't want to be that person either What's the difference between confidence and arrogance? Well, a confident person, I think, feels confident from the inside out. And let me explain what I mean. They humbly understand and acknowledge that God has given them some gifts. But they realize it is a gift given from God for His purposes. Some people take their gifts and their abilities and they use them to build themselves up. And they say constantly, look at me, look at me, look at me. And some people have a false humility and say, well, I don't really have any gifts and there's nothing I can do. That's not true. The Bible says we all have gifts that were given to us, at least one, by God. They're called spiritual gifts. He just talked about them in, in 1 Corinthians 12. But the humble person who is confident yet humble says, I have these gifts and look at God. Look at God as I use these gifts to glorify Him. You know, if I go to a surgeon... I want them to be confident that they know what they're doing and they can do the job. Have you all seen that commercial that's out now where the guy, the doctor comes in and he says to the patient, says, are you nervous about this surgery? And the guy goes, yeah. He goes, yeah, me too. You know, I, I, don't, want, I don't want that to be my, my surgeon. I think he said he just got off probation or something like that. Um, but the confident person doesn't overestimate their abilities either. They know where their limits are. 
They know what they're strong at and what they know, but they also are willing to admit what they're weak in and what they don't know. And a conf- it takes confidence to say, I know this, but I don't know this. And maybe you need to talk to somebody else uh, about that. You know, in Muhammad Ali's heyday as the heavyweight champion in boxing, it said that he had taken his seat on a 747, and they were starting to taxi down the runway for takeoff when the flight attendant walked by and noticed that, that Ali didn't have his seatbelt on. So she said to the, to the champ, she said, uh, Sir, please fasten your seatbelt. Well, Ali, was, he was very confident. He was always joking with people going on, and, and he said, uh, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And without missing the beat, the flight attendant looked back at him and said, Superman don't need no plane either. Put your seatbelt on. <laughs> Which, it's good to know your limitations, isn't it? Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says this, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but with, to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith, that God has assigned. God wants us to be confident that we have abilities and gifts, but he wants us to have sober judgment about ourselves and to be humble in realizing they're a gift from God and they're to be used for God and his purposes. A confident person doesn't feel the need to boast. Former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher said this, and I, I loved it ever since I heard it. She said, being powerful is like being a lady. If you have to tell people that you are, you aren't. <laughs> Which is kind of the, it's true, isn't it? Confident people just do their thing and let their actions do the talking. They don't have to tell you. They just do it, and, and you can observe for yourself. They don't try to make a show of things. They just go about their business. Last week, we talked about how godly love doesn't boast, and it kind of goes with this thought of, of it not being arrogant. I like the way Proverbs 27 says it. It says, let another praise you. And not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. If you're truly good at something, people will figure it out. And the whole object is not for them to praise you. Now, people may encourage you, they may give you compliments, and, and we should encourage one another. And if somebody does a good job of something, by all means tell them. It, it, it really fires them up and makes them motivated to, to do it more. But it's not about us, is it? It's the, all the glory goes upward to God and people will figure it out you don't have to tell them that you're good at something plus isn't there just something about human nature that if you are the type of person that you go around and you're constantly bragging on yourself or you're bragging on your kids your kids are the smartest your kids are the most athletic your kids or all this my accomplishments this this there's something in our nature what do we want to do We want to give them a good dose of humility, don't we? We feel the need to just cut them down to size and say, well, let me tell you something about your kid that you think is perfect. Or let me tell you about your accomplishments or whatever. It brings out the worst in people when we boast or when we are putting our own attributes out there. The story is told about a CEO of a Fortune 500 company who pulled into a service station to get some gas. He went inside to pay, and when he came back out, he noticed that his wife was talking to the service station attendant. And then he noticed that that service station attendant was a guy that she had dated back in high school. So he let him finish the conversation. He went ahead and got in the car. When she got in the car, they pulled off, and for a few moments, they drove along in silence. But his, the wheels were spinning in his head, and finally, feeling pretty good about himself, he said, I bet I know what you're thinking. And she said, really what? He said, I bet you're thinking you're glad you married me, a Fortune 500 CEO and not him, a service station attendant. She said, no, I was thinking if I married him, he'd be a Fortune 500 CEO and you'd be a gas station attendant. (laughs) People feel the need to humble you when you're always trying to elevate yourself. The Bible says, though, that God feels much that same way toward us. That if we're always thinking that we're somebody and trying to put ourselves up there instead of glorifying God, God says, you know what? I have a way of knocking you back down to size and teaching you you're not as big as you think you are. Listen to Matthew 23. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. I think if we're wise, we'll be on the other end of that. We'll do the humbling and let God do the exalting. You know, true godly love and a confidence that comes from God must be submitted to God's leading. 
One of my earthly heroes in the faith is a man named George Mueller. And Mueller lived during the 1800s, and he was an evangelist, but he also ran an orphanage in, in Bristol, England. And he's remembered as being this man of great faith and prayer. He kept that orphanage funded. He never asked anyone for money. He would just talk to God and pray about it. And there's amazing stories of how money would come in just at the time it was needed as he had been praying. And there's all kinds of amazing stories I could share, but in the interest of time, I won't today. But when a man once asked George Mueller the secret of his powerful prayer life and his faith, uh, here's what he said. He said, there was a day when I died, utterly died. I died to George Mueller, his opinions, his preferences, tastes, and his will. I died to the world and its approval or censure. I died to the approval or blame even of my brethren and friends. And since then, I have studied to show myself approved only to God. Mueller got that thing about humbling yourself and said, you know what, it's not about me. When he prayed, his prayers were about the kingdom of God. He was so in tune with the heart of God that his prayers had power because he was synced up with God. Mueller completely humbled himself and submitted every part of his life to God's leadership. As a result, this humbled man, God took him and he exalted him and he lifted him up. And today we're still pointing to a man like George Mueller as a role model of the faith and what our prayer life should look like today. Um, and God exalted him. You know, God's love is for everyone. You know, during Mahatma Gandhi's student days, he, he read the Gospels, and he was looking for a solution to India's caste system. Now, if you're not familiar with the caste system, that is this, this part that was this Hindu belief that people were ranked differently in society. There were the, the Brahmin priests that were at the top, and there were different levels of people, and down at the bottom there was a group of people called the untouchables. And they didn't have much pity or compassion for the people at the bottom because the Hindus believe in reincarnation. So they believe that based upon your past lives, whatever you, if you were down here socially, you deserve that. That was your punishment for your past lives. And if you were up here, you deserve that. That was your reward for things you've done in the past. And so Gandhi didn't agree with this, and he wanted to find a, a, a way to combat this mentality in Indian culture. So he began reading about uh, the Gospels and learning about Christianity, and he decided to go to a church and ask a, a minister how to become a Christian. Because he saw in Jesus this ideal that we're all God's children and we're all equal at the foot of the cross. However, when he entered the building, it said that the usher refused to give him a seat and he suggested that he should go and worship with his own people. Gandhi said, it was said to have left the church and never returned. And it said that he quoted, If Christians have caste differences also, I might as well remain a Hindu. Acts chapter 10 says, so Peter opened his mouth and he said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. That's God's mentality. That's how God's love operates. He doesn't care what skin color you are. He doesn't care what nationality, what your past is, how checkered it may be. If you're willing to put your faith in Jesus Christ, God says there's a place for you in the family of God. Amen? And that must be our attitude today. Maybe some of you were raised in a home where you were taught some things that as you look into the Bible, you go, you know what? What my parents always said may not be the truth. It may not be the right way to think. And I've got some things that are a part of my mentality and my upbringing and my view of the world that need to change because God's truth conquers anything from our past, right? Our, our mentalities, and when you know better, you do better. And maybe that's where some are today. You know, uh, Guys, not only is, is racism an embarrassingly ignorant blight on our nation's history, it's not consistent with the love of God to make differences among people because of the color of their skin. John chapter 7, verse 24 says, Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. And in Galatians chapter 3, he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one. In Christ Jesus, 
I got news for you. One of these days when we get to our eternal home and we're gathered around the throne of God, you're going to be on your knees and there's going to be somebody of dark pigmentation on this side, somebody of light pigment skin pigmentation on this side. There's going to be people speaking languages you understand, languages you don't understand. We're all going to be there around the throne praising the same God who saved us all. And that must be the attitude of godly love that we have today in his church. The true love that comes from God doesn't make distinctions among people based not only upon their race, but on their ethnic background. Uh, he doesn't make differences based upon income level or what, what you have and, or don't have in terms of material possessions. He doesn't care about your popularity on this earth, your social standings, your titles, your positions, or your, your popularity. He's not interested in those things. He's interested in your heart. Will you yield your heart to him? Romans 12, 16 says, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Never think you're too good to serve anybody, to serve or to spend time or to take time to invest in anybody. You know, love is not rude, the scriptures go on to say. In verses 4 and 5, it's not arrogant or rude. Rudeness has been defined as offensively impolite or disrespectful. Rudeness is, is finding more and more of a place in our culture today, isn't it? If you watch, it just seems like uh, it's okay to be rude today. And in some circles, it's celebrated to be rude, to roast somebody, to tell them how it is, to put them in their place. And we all say, yeah. And I think social media has turned this up to a whole new level because we will say things behind the screen or type it into our phone that we wouldn't say face to face with somebody. Perfect strangers can put their political view out there or something that we don't agree with and somehow, for some reason, we feel the need to tell them what an idiot they are for thinking something so stupid as that. And we just cut them down to size. And we don't even think about it anymore. It seems to be what everybody is doing. I get so angry when people are rude and unnecessarily mean to others. Uh, there's an account in the Old Testament that tells about a time when the prophet Elisha had, had been, he responded to people who were being rude to him. And uh, we all would probably feel like responding this way. This is the natural reaction. It's in 2 Kings chapter 2. This might be one of those passages you didn't know was in the Bible. It says, he went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Now, why did they have to go there? Talking about a man's hair. I don't understand that. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. That's in the Bible, people. I'm not making that up. Now, we've all felt like doing that. When somebody wrongs us, calls us bald-headed, there's no sense in that, right? I don't have a spiritual application for that scripture. I'm just saying it's in the Bible. We feel like doing it. My temptation to be rude usually is not to be mean, but I have sarcasm that, that kind of is part of my humor. And sometimes something so good comes to my mind, I can't keep it from coming out my mouth, right? Like when I was in college, I, I was thinking this week about my, my best friend, he called my dorm room. Now, young people, you got to understand, this was before cell phones. We had these phones that hung on the wall, and it was connected to a cord. And you'd have to stand by the wall the whole time you were talking on the cord. And, it, and you didn't just push a button, and it's about, you had to go on the, on the wall like that. So picture a phone on a wall with a cord. My best friend calls my dorm room. And I answered the phone and said, hello. He goes, hey, where are you? <laughs> and I didn't want to be mean, but the sarcastic part came out. And I said, let's just review the facts here. You called my room. My phone is hanging on the wall attached. I answered that said phone. You tell me where I am. <laughs> he goes, yeah, I guess that's kind of dumb, wasn't it? I don't mean to be mean, but sometimes it's sarcasm that, that leads us to maybe not be so kind. But rudeness, if you think about it, it's related to selfishness, isn't it? When you just are mean to people, rude, and you don't care. People say, I don't care what they think. And they kind of get that going right there like that. And they tell them and they put them in their place. But if you think about it, it's selfish to be rude. 
And it's kind of ignorant to be rude to people. As a Christian, okay, we are the image bearers of Christ. It does matter what they think. Because if they associate us with Christ, then they associate that rudeness with Christ. And how dare we blaspheme his name by portraying him in that light. For some of you, maybe you do okay until somebody makes you mad. Don't be content to say, well, I just have a temper. And if you set me off, you're just going to get what you get. So don't cross me. That's not the way to be as a Christian. Again, image bearers of Christ. Um, I, I encourage you to pray. If you struggle with your temper, pray and make that a, a focus of your prayer life. And ask God to give you restraint and help you grow in this aspect of love. Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. A fool just says, hey, I have a temper. Let's just let it go and see what happens here. Some people need to be told anyway. That's not what the Christian does. A Christian says, Lord, help me to hold this back. Help me to develop a filter and to filter my thoughts and my words before I just let, leave them out there. I've heard waitresses say that the rudest crowd can be the Sunday afternoon after church crowd. And that's not funny because that's us, right? How dare they mess up our order? How dare they keep us waiting? We've been sitting here forever. You need to speed things up around here. How dare you overcook my burger? Guys, as ambassadors of Christ, our rudeness can harm the cause of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. What if you are totally okay and valid to say, you know, well, we've been sitting here for 30 minutes. Nobody's taken our order yet. But they come to the table and you say, that's fine. I'm not any more important. I, I can see you're busy. you got other people. That's fine. That would stand out and make Christ look good, wouldn't it? Now, there's a right way and a wrong way to do almost everything. And guys, people in this day and age who still have manners, they stand out from the crowd. People notice that like a breath of fresh air in our current climate that we live in today. I love to hear people, especially young people, still say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. No, sir, no, ma'am. Don't you love that? Call people Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so. And they don't have to do that. That's why it's respectful when you choose to do it. I love to see children who respect their parents. Uh, the phone in my classroom is right by my desk. And so sometimes the kids will ask to use the phone to call home, and you listen to some of those conversations. You're not trying to, but you're sitting there at your desk, you know, and you hear, bring it up here now. I need it now. And I'm like, is that your mama? <laughs> you better tell her you love her before you hang that up, right? And some of them will. They'll say, thank you for bringing it up here. Please, I appreciate that. Thank you much. I love you. And I'm like, you're a good kid because you're, you are showing respect to your parents. I love to see spouses respect their spouse and, and, and treat them with respect. Christian love, there's nothing about it that makes people feel less than. There's nothing about the love of God that makes people feel disrespected. Titus chapter 3 says, To speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. That's our goal. Now, we, we mess up. We lose our temper. We Say things before we think. God's grace. But listen, our goal is to be that. Let's be careful with our words. Let's be careful with our body language and our tone. You know, parents, you've said this before. The kids go, what? I didn't say nothing. It's not what you said. It's what? It's how you said it. It's that dumb look you had on your face when you rolled your eyes at me and said it. That's what it is. Right? But guys, choose politeness. Choose respect. Choose manners, because that's how Christ wants to be represented in his world today. The, the final thing that this passage today tells us is that love doesn't insist on its own way. In verse 5, it just says as much. Ladies, I, I'm going to pick on you for just a minute and use you as an example, so please forgive me in advance. But I'm just going to give you an example from my house that I bet you is a lot like your house, okay? Okay. Guys, we are taking our wife out to eat, right? Date night, whatever it is. And you say to your wife, honey, where would you like to eat tonight? And she inevitably says, oh, I don't care, right? Anywhere is fine with me. 
So we drive down the road a little bit, and I say, well, how about here? Oh, no, we ate that yesterday. I don't want that again. So we drive on down a little further, and I say, well, how about here? No, nah, I'm not in the mood for that. So we drive on down a little further. What about here? Oh, gross. No, I'm not eating there. <laughs> not going to do that. And so I've been known to just kind of pull over, stop at the light, and say, well, obviously you do have an opinion about where we eat, so why don't you just pick the restaurant? Because I didn't get like this, being picky. I can eat anything. <laughs> you choose it. I'm convinced, ladies, that the power you all have is you make us think we're making the choice, but really you're making it all along, aren't you? <laughs> my wife, I'm the head of our household, but my wife's the neck. She's learned how to turn me anyway. She wants. I thought I was making the decisions for a long time. But the self-seeking person, now I'm not saying, ladies, that you're self-seeking. I'm just trying to have a little fun there. But the self-seeking person constantly forces people to adjust to them and what they want. And I think sometimes we don't even realize that we're doing it. If, if you are self-aware enough to realize that you are a type A personality, that things have to be just this way, you're kind of a control freak, sometimes we call that, right? And it needs to happen this way, this is the way it needs to look, and, and we tend to um, make everybody play our game, right? And, and this might be where we need to check ourselves. The self-seeking person at work, the project's got to go just the way you see it going. And you've got to have control over all the moving parts. The meetings and the get-togethers have to work around your agenda. Everybody else needs to compromise, but you've got these things you're going to do, and you're not going to change. Everybody's got to accommodate you. Or my plans and my desires come before what other people might need from me. You're just going to have to wait because this is what I'm doing. And we impose our will on everybody else. Guys, I've shared before about how my selfishness, this came to light early in, in my marriage, Dana and I hadn't been married too many years, and we, um, I think Caleb was around three years old, and Cameron was still a baby, and um, I was totally unaware that I was doing this, but I was teaching school, I was coaching football, and I had started preaching at a little church, and I was doing all the things that I'd ever dreamed of doing. I wanted to do all those. I had a beautiful wife, I had two healthy children, I checked all the boxes, had everything that, that I had always wanted. And I was living the dream. But what I came to realize is that my wife wasn't living the dream as a part of that. While I was out doing all those things, uh, our boys were young, and my wife was, um, she would work all day, and then she'd go pick up the kids, and she'd come home, get them fed, and do 95% uh, of the child care and all that stuff involved. Meanwhile, I would come in later at night and tell her all about this football game we had won, and I was so excited. And I said, honey, why aren't you excited like me? And I looked at her, and I came to realize her countenance had been broken because for so long, it had been all about me and what I wanted and what I was chasing and what I was pursuing, and she had gotten pushed to the back burner. And I tell you that story today just to tell you how, how, how some selfishness can creep in to your marriage and other relationships where it gets to be too much about what you want. I didn't consciously do that to her I didn't consciously say I'm going to be selfish and she's just going to have to go along with it but it's like the light came on and I realized some priorities have got to change I'm not doing right by her and and that was my wife helped me figure that out you know and I'm thankful that she was patient with me and devoted but um, but sometimes maybe I'm speaking to people today that if you're honest you think you know what I'm being selfish in this relationship I'm insisting on my goals my dreams and I'm pushing some people to the background and I need to pour into other people instead of making it about me love is not self-seeking sometimes we bring this attitude into the church don't we uh, sometimes you may hear folks say I just want to find a church where I have my needs met where that, that, that fills all the things I'm looking for in this church. And if things don't go our way, I'm going to go down the road and find another church that does meet our family's needs. But actually, the Apostle Paul said that just the opposite of that should be our attitude about church. In 1 Corinthians 14, he says, Strive to excel in building up the church. 
instead of complaining about what it is or what it isn't, why not get in there and invest and be the change that you want to see? We should come to church with an attitude, not that we're going to go in and, wa- and spectate and evaluate the worship. Do you realize you are the worship? Their attitude ought to be, I'm going to church and I'm bringing the worship today. And I don't know what everybody else is doing, but I am bringing my worship up in there. And when you get done, the question isn't, what did you think about the worship? What did you think about the message? What did you think about the music? Whatever it might be. But what did God think about my worship today? That's what we ought to be asking when we come out. We should come with the attitude that we're going to get involved. That we're going to be the church and not just receive. Not not just that consumer mentality. What can the church do for me? What does God want me to do to be a part of his church? Completely different mentality. If you want to love people with the love of God, and I'm, I'm getting ready to step on home plate here, be open to just going with the flow. And if you're a type A personality, you're going to have to loosen up a little bit about some things, especially when it comes to relationships. And realize that you can't control everything about other people. You'll drive yourself crazy trying to do it. Parents, you can't control everything about other people, right? Uh, You've got to learn to let some things go. Go with the flow and love people. You know, frequently remind yourself when you're a part of a group such as a church, your workplace, or anything else, it's not all about me. It's not all about me. I need to make allowances and leave room for grace and other people and their, their thoughts. Godly love invests. It doesn't just receive, but it says, what can I put in to this relationship, into this organization? That's the attitude that Jesus lived with. Here's what the scriptures say in Mark chapter 10. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus washed feet. Jesus ministered to people when he was physically exhausted and had nothing left from a physical standpoint to give. Jesus had compassion that drove him. He had the love of God flowing through him. And so many times, even before the Garden of Gethsemane that we talked about last week, so many times Jesus must have said, not my will, but thine be done. There's some more people that need me today. There are some more things that need to be accomplished today. You know, today if you're here and you've never invited that Savior to be your Lord and your Savior, I pray that today will be a day of salvation for you. If you understand this, I've sinned. And even one sin makes me not a good person, makes me a sinner. Then I only one thing can cancel that out, and that's the blood of Jesus. We can accept Jesus Christ into our heart by praying and inviting him to be the Lord of our life. He asks that we repent of our sins. That means I'm willing to turn and what I know is wrong, I'm going to try to walk away from that and I'm going to invite Jesus to lead me into what God wants for the rest of my life. Now you'll still need his grace and I have to ask for his forgiveness every day. But I have put my trust in him and what he's done on the cross and I want you to do the same because nobody gets out of this world alive without Jesus. And if you've never received him as your Lord and Savior, why not today? Why not profess that you believe his payment on the cross is your ticket to heaven? Put your hope in him. He wants you to be baptized and to die to your old self, to be washed clean and raise up a new person. And God says he will fill with his Holy Spirit. And now everything from this point forward is you and God together. And the changes that you can't make in your own life, God says, I'll help you. I'll give you confidence in me that comes from the inside out I'll give you gifts and strength that's not your own to do these things but always remember your salvation and every good thing comes from me that's that humble love we talked about today will you humble yourself today and say I need a savior maybe you're here and you'd like to rededicate yourself and you say I'm not loving people because I'm not tuned into the love of God the way that I should be and I want to recommit to that won't you come and we'll pray for you we'll encourage you And maybe there's a situation in your life, a relationship in your life that needs to be turned around. And maybe God's love is just the answer you need today. If you need prayer support, you step in there. It could be for yourself. It could be for somebody that's weighing on your heart. Step into that prayer room. There will be people that care about you that would be glad to agree with you in prayer over a situation in your life. There will be no judgment for stepping in that room. Listen, every one of us needs to be in that room at some time, right? We all need to step in there and say, I need a power bigger than myself to help me deal with some things. 
You step in there if that's what's on your heart today. Let's stand together as we sing.